Uh, I'm David Philp of uh, the, the BIM Task Group in the, in the UK. And delighted to be here again at uh, the, the CETA BIM gathering. And uh, well, what's today about? Well, for me, I hope it's about three things. I hope it's about learning, learning something new about BIM and what it can do for you. Share, you know, start to share. This is very much a collaborative process. Share ideas, share thoughts, and connect. There is a truly global audience here today. It's a great opportunity to meet some new people and connect, to make some, hopefully, some good long-term relationships. But today, well, what's it about for us? It's an opportunity to share the BIM Task Group, what we've been doing in terms of UK, and how that program's going. But uh, for me, it's great to be back. We've been supporting CETA. You can see me, hopefully, there. I was at the very first uh, event over here. And it was very much about telling this story about more for less, how BIM could help, especially in terms of public sector, give more to the, back to that public purse. And I've got to admit, I was hugely encouraged because when I came across the last time, I actually found you had your own BIM state agency. So already in Ireland, well, that's what it said in the world of Google anyway, it says you were already hugely on this journey, but uh, I wasn't too sure about the logo. It seemed a bit more about COD, but uh, it was, uh, well, that's what it says in Google, so it must be true. But, uh, Great. I mean, we've been on this journey now with CETA for at least a year, so I think the conversation's growing. It's probably less about the what and the why, and we're probably starting to move, move more towards, if you like, the how. How do we start to make this very much real? In terms of UK government, we're halfway through a four-year programme, so for us, it's pretty much sharing with you our lessons learned. So this is pretty much our half-term report, and you can see, you can maybe gauge yourself and give us a, an A, B, or C at the end of the day. We heard about it already from, from Minister, from, from Deke. It's about change, and I think that's a big thing when we talk about BIM. It is very much about change, disruptive change. Actually, it's about transforming industry. So I think in terms of what BIM is, well, for me, it's not a silver bullet. I think that's a key thing. BIM is there very much as an enabler. It's there to enable better procurement. It's there to enable better collaboration. And these digital tools we talk about are very much there to help make that happen. So it's about change. And I think that's a very hard thing. So, well, what's BIM about? I asked Alan Hoare about it. He said, well, BIM is not bad. And I completely agree. So if it's not bad, it must be good. So that's there. It's about innovation. It is about transformation of your AEC sector. It's good at different levels. First of all, forget about government, it should be good for your business. It should be axiomatic that actually, despite clients asking for it, it's good for you. It's about new, and we heard so we talking about the exportable skills. You can start to export new skills, new opportunities, and start to think how BIM can give your organisation new competitive advantage. And I think what we can see, you know, typical BIM model, well, what does it do? It starts with the fact we can now virtually design things. We can make smart decisions as a collaborative team. We can review things, especially in terms of safety, CDM. But we heard from the minister this morning, starting to think more and more about how do we start to get better outcomes. And I think that's the key thing about BIM. It's not about the better models. We can get the nice Hollywood BIM. We can flash things about. But how do we turn that into better outcomes for our customers. So start to think very much about asset outcomes and indeed business outcomes as well. And I think that's very key. But for you, I think there's a compelling message for your business, this, what that is, how you leverage these data sets to get much better outcomes in terms of what you do. So thinking about virtual design, procure, build, and probably the last bit, you heard it from Deke, this is an important word, operate how we actually use our assets, and I think that's key. We hear the term AEC so much, and it kind of stops the construction. I'd love to add that O at the end of things. We actually use our assets. We need to learn from them and start to feed back. It's good for your clients as well. I think that's a key thing. It's about adding value and optimizing asset outcomes. So we're starting to see BIM more and more about plan preventative maintenance. How do we simulate it? How do we optimize? But we're also thinking more and more about asset outcomes, starting to think about whole asset in terms of especially life cycle costing. We can simulate it and we can optimise it for clients as well. So very much for clients achieving better outcomes using your data set. And I think for me this is one of the key things. We heard it from Celine that they actually, you know, this is a chance for us, I think, to rebrand our industry. This is about drawing investment in as well. So 
this is starting to become an economic message. And I think, you know, for young people coming into construction, we've got to move away from that world of muddy boots. We've got to transform. And actually, for me, one of the things about BIM is it should be about starting to create an industry to be proud of, that people want to come in. It's about creating, I think, pretty much a new sustainable legacy for our industry. So I think in terms of investment, rebranding, it's a fantastic opportunity. And we heard that it's about sustaining your GVA, or quite, I think it's 6.4%. I was listening, so that's quite good. UK, 6.7 gross value add is what construction brings to the economy. 89.5 billion. One of our key metrics for our BIM programme will be, did we sustain it? Did we get growth in terms of what we're doing? So it's an economic imperative in terms of what we're doing. You know, trying to make money into that piggyback. And I'm sure in terms of what you're doing, it's a key, key part of how you move that. There's a harsh reality behind this. If we don't, if government hadn't made intervention, that GVA would have fallen away. So no longer can we accept that low productivity. So our national economy, we've got to think more and more about BIM. How do we get better outcomes? OCED estimates there's at least 40 trillion US dollars of infrastructure investment out there to be leveraged by 2030. All the companies around about the world are starting to think more and more, how do we unlock it? How do we be more competitive? How do we start to think about new ways of working? And what we are starting to see is starting to think about not just BIM in isolation, but BIM, we've heard it today already, starting to think about lean, starting to think about design for manufacturing assembly and the kits of parts. What you see in this video, China, people starting to think about new products. Maybe the term is UK, maybe five, ten years from now. The reality is we'll probably build less Morgans and more Nissans in terms of our assets. But starting to think about new ways of working, building the kits of parts, taking the waste out of it, lean. And I think that's a key thing we're starting to see just now. But what we would say is BIM is front and centre around the globe. It's not just here in Ireland, not just in the UK. Last week we're in Estonia, Denmark, Switzerland all hearing the same stories, people trying to be more productive in terms of what they're doing. 30 stories, 15 days, new ways of working. And that's what we're seeing BIM actually starting to do, start to help transform new ways of thinking and new products. So it's starting to transform our marketplace. So not just in the UK, but very much that global message. There you go. So next time I come here, we'll see a few more of these over here in Dublin. And again, I think what we're probably starting to see is probably one of the biggest changes in our generation. Probably the most exciting time, I think, ever to be involved in construction, but it's very much a time of change. Well, what does that change look like? For me, we're having this change of moving from an analogue built environment, analogue procurement, to actually a built environment that's got a new digital economy. So I think it's a change in terms of economy, moving from analogue to one in terms of procurement digital procurement. So in the UK, BIM, very much part of the procurement process. So not a nice information graphical model that sits to the left, but embedding it with how we procure. So using data to make smart procurement decisions. We are seeing the whole built environment entering a digital revolution. Projects such as Crossrail will be built at least four times. Three times the model, coordinate it, simulate it, optimise, build it flawlessly on site. So built better before built in that model environment. So we are starting to think more and more about how we use our data better. So a move from analogue to digital, well, a big part of that has got to be thinking about computer-readable data. So here Deke speak about it. It's about the data, be it graphical, non-graphical, but starting to think how we use our data sets. This ain't new. BIM's been about in some forms, at least in terms of a philosophy, at least since the 1960s, you know, beating binary cars. It's only now we're probably starting to get the scalability. And I think we've got the perfect storm, you know, in terms of our economic crisis, we've had to think different. But this is very much how do you use computer readable data? You do it all the time. You buy digital, you buy it from the likes of Amazon, or you put in a code, it becomes global. You can buy your products from anywhere in the world. I could go into a locker in Hammersmith, usually two days, put a code in and get my book. So what BIM's going to do, it's going to be a globalisation of our built environment. And I think that's key. UK, well, one of the things I think we're doing is we've got an industry in training, if you like. We call them data drops, data transactions. But that's essentially what we're trying to do. We heard about Kobe. 
Well, we're using Kobe to help give us better assets, but also to train industry in giving us good quality, keyword there, quality data transactions very consistently. So start to think about industry. How do we train consistently, whole sector, doing data transactions? And we're seeing a huge amount of growth in terms of data in the built environment. And what we're seeing is, you know, we're not going to be exempt, but it's how you use it. Starting to think about foresight, but it's no longer just about your own data in terms of your architectural model, your structural model. It's starting to think about relational databases, semantic data, how you connect it up to maybe crime statistics, whether to make smart decisions. So your own data is no longer enough. It's starting to change as well careers. What we're starting to see is new roles emerging, BIM managers, data managers, people that can mine big data sets. So this is going to have a profound effect in terms of education and future job profiles. But it's not all about these lovely geometrical models that we all so much love. You know, we see them the term in the UK, it's starting to model bloating. We try and put all this non-graphical data into our 3D models, and actually it ain't the best place for it, we've found. So we're thinking more and more, how do we hang it off it? We use our GUIs, we use these locators to think how we link databases together, be it costs, be it geospatial data, but it's not about all this information living in a geometrical model. It's how we start to connect databases together that's very much key. And what we're starting to see is, you know, part of our talk is about a digital built Britain. So we're starting to go beyond single assets and thinking more about big data, enterprise level data. And if we start to put intelligence around about that, we start to think about insight and foresight. And that's very key. We heard that this morning in terms of as we make future decisions, how do we get data foresight? And if we do that, we've got that insight, we action it, we get the better outcomes. And again, BIM, if anything, forget what it means. It should always be about how we get better outcomes from what we do. This is very much about technology-based business outcomes. We heard Deke talk about that move, if you like, from CAD, the digital link, to the world of parametric modeling, but again, about data. Retail does it all the time, electronic point of sale. So when Alan goes into his local weight rows, buys his nightly bottle of whiskey, is it Alan, every night? So he buys it, he scans it, captures a bit of data that these supermarkets can actually make some foresight on. So they know buy some lemons and limes, they've got that data there. So this is what we're trying to do in terms of computer readable data to give us foresight to make smarter decisions. And in the UK, it was all based upon a backstory, the inconvenient truth that we had to try and save 20% in CapEx cost by 2016. Well, you don't save 20% 20 20 by going to the supply chain saying, give us a little off your price. So this was about better procurement and making smarter decisions in terms of procurement process. So 20% capital cost. At the same time, thinking very much about the sustainability agenda. How do we make better carbon energy decisions using our data sets? And also thinking about, you know, we mandated not just BIM, but government soft landings. Very much key learning from the asset lifecycle, feedback loops, through post-occupancy evaluation, but starting to sweat our assets better to get better asset outcomes. So, then convenient truth, we live still in a war economy. We're having to make our assets perform better and indeed longer. So, key need in terms of government as a public sector client. How many folk here have read UK government construction strategy? Uh, yeah, I'll take that. You know, we talked about it last year, but uh, it is worth a read. And what you will see, it doesn't set BIM out in isolation. It's part of a wider strategy with various interventions. New forms of procurement, about collaborative uh, working, project bank accounts, setting the right behaviours for BIM to thrive in. And that's key. And you hear about that over the currency of other speakers. Laura Handler is going to talk about the social technological sort of impact. But government in the UK has mandated on all projects in terms of cost, so there's no trigger threshold, so scalability, big projects, little projects, new build, infrastructure, all covered. So we want 3D geometry, but the big part is we want the non-graphical data sets as well. We want that especially in terms of asset information, to think more and more about operational life cycle by 2016, so not from 2016. So every week we're working with government departments, switching them on. So when we come out the door on the 1st of January 2016, we've reached 100%. So we're ramping up, learning, refining to get to 100% by 2016. So it's about clients that can procure better using their data, creating more stable briefs, better early involvement from the supply chain, and we're starting to think more and more about visibility for your transactions. 
But actually, this is about alignment. It's alignment of the entire asset life cycle. So we're starting to think more and more about maybe the terms beyond delivery. We're starting to think more and more about operational. In fact, how many folk here today are from, well, we've heard the term owner, but maybe from facilities management background? Oh, you lonely souls, but hopefully we'll start to see more and more of you. And again, this comes back to education. Why are universities not trying to make FM, you know, courses of choice? This should be a, much, it's a key part of what we're doing. Let's start thinking about it more in terms of early undergraduate programs. So our, our hypothesis, quite simple, open shareable asset data is going to give better outcomes, better cost, better value, and better carbon. So it's simple hypothesis. And you heard it from Deke, this is about a behavioural change in thinking about project life cycle. So traditionally we've got somebody that's got a piggy bank that's got my OPEX cost, the design and construct cost. Someone's got this huge bag of cash that we don't think about very often, operational cost that's maybe, I don't know, at least a thousand times bigger than that cost of design and construct. And they never really speak. So a big part of what we're trying to do in the UK, new term, TOTEX, total expenditure. And we're thinking, how can BIM start to give us the data sets, that foresight we talked about, to make smarter whole life cycle decisions? So we're starting to use our data not just to make design construct decisions, but operational whole life decisions. So this is a change program for us. It starts off with a D, dissatisfaction, we can do it better. We've got a vision. We've got F, which I can never remember what it stands for, so you can have F for yourself and put anything you want in there. But it's different factors, factors of influence. And CL, I remember that one, which is change leadership. So we had a vision, and it's about culture. It's about changing heuristic bias. You know, I've always done it this way. It's starting to think about how we build twice. Start to build models that we're going to use, and collaboration, doing it together. And we talked about this actually building Smart and Zurich last week. And we actually said, is it this big orchestra, or actually is it a chamber orchestra that we're bringing together, or actually is it jazz music? So we spent a lot of time thinking about this, but essentially, Who's the conductor? Well, it could be the client bringing that whole team together, the FM team, the design team, early doors. But BIM's there. It's a data set that flows right the way through it. It tells that entire picture. So structured data to make smart decisions. And what we know is, forget about lonely BIM, the architect's got a model. We're starting to think more and more about the orchestra of people that's going to make smart decisions. And what we are seeing are typical, if you like, the geometrical model. Well, it's starting to change things, I think, in terms of culture. Can we run the video? Yeah. What we're seeing is, you know, simple geometrical model, but we're starting to think it's giving us lots of things. It's giving us collaboration. So we've got a commercial team sitting around with a design team starting to make smart decisions. Well, what does that mean? It means we're starting to engage and procure special contractors earlier on in the supply chain. We're also starting to think more and more about safety. We're embedding CDM data. We're starting to think about soft clashes. We're starting to think more and more about productivity. You can maybe see it there. We're starting to think about tower crane utilization. But starting to think even this low-hanging fruit of coordination is starting to kickstart and enable much, much better collaborative decision making. But again, always a need for it. It's about getting better outcomes that's key. Thanks. There we go. So BIM, very much better way of working, starting to think entire asset life cycle. And for us, it is. We're in the 21st century. This is starting to become the digital campfire, somewhere that people crumb round about to make smart decisions. And this is a bit I want to see. I'd love to see this, that people actually coming around the model, the right people, the plumbers, if you like, the folk that we be putting insulation on, to make smart decisions on productivity. So we've got to start thinking about not just BIM, in terms of being a designer's office, but trying to create these big rooms, or like small rooms with iPads, the models there for people to make smart decisions. Constraints analysis, but start to think about lean ways of working around about what we're doing as well. So BIM, well, I sometimes hate to try and define what it is, but for us, we mentioned halfway through the programme, it's about consistency in terms of data sets, a collaborative industry. And I think that's what we're seeing, if you like, in terms of why we've got 300 people coming in the next couple of days. This is about collaboration, trying to improve our industry. And BIM is offering us clear, open, transparent communication. The I is probably the key part, information within there, high quality information that can be tested, procured, and it's there for purpose. It supports business outcomes. Modeling, don't like the word, because actually it's about modeling and management more than anything. It's how we manage data sets, we create it, we use it. But it's about starting to think not just about simulation, 
but analysing that data set, refining it to get better outcomes. Ultimately, how do you give a client a better business outcome? And this is a law. If we do a BIM presentation in the UK, you've got to use this maturity wedge, but I think it is quite worthwhile because it shows, Deek mentioned, you know, in the UK, probably 20 years of creating digital ink, if you like, which we call level zero. I'm starting to think about, you know, a technology change, if you like, probably 20, 30 years at least to make that happen. We then move to what we call level one. We're starting to think about 3D geometry, but we put one of the first key building blocks in, in terms of BIM, collaborative, data environment, very much key. And you see the green band there, four years in the UK, level two to BIM, something object-orientated modeling, library management, and a common data environment. So essentially three things are in there. And we mentioned this is about moving towards a digital built Britain. So red line, 2016, we're all there in terms of government, but we're starting to think beyond that now. We're starting to think about level three, moving from, if you like, collaboration, series of models that are brought together and federated, to start to think now about an integrated model, level three, whatever that is. So in the UK, we've got a team now that's starting to scope and think beyond level two, looking at it from the technology side in terms of development of IFC, but also politically, where are the use cases for client in terms of if we start to get an integrated model, if indeed there is any. So actually, it all comes down, we heard about process and standards as key for us, and I call it the bedrock that's there. So we've got document in the UK, PAS 1192 Part 2, but it's not about one document in isolation, it's actually about a series of documents. And it starts back in the world of analogue, and I think this is very much key for us, but that information, project information, be it in BIM, be it in analogue, it's about how do we actually start to use that in a single collaborative digital or data environment. So CDE is very key to us, be it in BIM or non-BIM. So that, if you like, that collaborative data environment, very much key. And what we see in terms of the BIM, people say, we've got a BIM problem. 90% of the time is back to the bedrock. There's no BIM problem. It comes back to, are you doing good design management? We've got BS 7000 out there, bedrock stuff, good procurement. And we actually find, if anything, BIM stress tests very much additional design management and procurement route. So get them in place first, very much key. So our key artifacts in terms of BIM, in terms of UK, we've got our processes for that common data environment that we mentioned for our suite of documentation. We heard Deep talk about Kobe, that's our non-graphical data set, and we've got a UK version of that now. It's got more carbon fields, and we're testing that all the time, which we'll mention in a moment. We've got the bit, we've still got it, unfortunately, the 2D PDFs, because we still need it in terms of regulatory, contractually, cut from the model. We've also got, and I think this is a key part for us, the BIM commercial suite, our protocols, our execution plan. So we're starting to think more and more about how do we inject BIM into that contract hierarchy. So start to think about these data transactions and the role of the information manager, someone responsible for actually making it happen. And indeed the bit, and it's a powerful part as well, are 3D models. So UK government technology agnostic. And this for us is pretty much level two BIM in terms of our PAS. Won't go through it in any detail other than to say a couple of things. A, hopefully you see it is a 360 degree process. Starts top right, starting very much with the end in mind client that knows what asset data they want to make the smart outcomes. It's got a feedback loop, if you like, so we've got data foresight, we mentioned soft landings, learning from our assets. So one of the things we've mandated, post-occupancy evaluation, did the asset do what it said in the tin? So we're always learning from our assets, feeding it back, learning the lessons. When we come to brief, we've got data foresight. Clients, key document, BIM EIRs, BIM Employers Information Requirements. Again, you can start to see transactions. So what stages in the project life cycle does a client need data and how much data they want? So very much key, starting to put together a, a, a very concise action plan with key data outcomes. But the key bit, start to think about data exchanges to answer what we call plain language questions. It might be cost questions or carbon questions. And again, you probably can't see this at the back, way up there, but just again, back to key concept. Plan of work, key stages that give information that's got purpose. That what a client needs to make decisions. So that might be, can I afford it? Does it meet my area targets? So we transact upon data, we query the model to maybe look at the graphical model in terms of geomet geometrical data, the non-graphical data, 
but data transactions to answer questions for a client, very much key, as you probably would use in the world of internet banking, where you can query how much they spent in my messages that last month, have I got to change my supermarket. So smart data to make smart decisions. A key part as well, data procurement, right amount of information at the right time. So we don't want to overload our models early on, but the information that's appropriate. So right amount of information at the right time. And what we're calling that is a digital plan of work, both in terms of level of detail, geometrically, and level of information, non-graphical. But the key part, the asset information model, we're always feeding back the show 10, 20, 30 years, feeding back that data set, and actually making sure we can manage that model right the way through that entire asset life cycle with information that's correct, because just because we're doing this in the world of BIM doesn't mean that information is correct. So BIM, many ways for us to achieve our data requirements, but many ways to check it as well. So data transactions, common data environment, we can check it and we can use it. So for government, many, many ways of actually using it. And we've got all these testing tools as well. And that's why Kobe is so important for us. It also helps us in terms of populating our CAFM systems, computer-assisted facilities model. So government, private sector, 18 months or eight months to a year to do that. Usually inconsistent, incorrect. For using Kobe, we can start to capture it, we start to prepare for it, and we can automate that process right the way through. So we don't have that loss of data. So it's very much key to departments. Plus, we're starting to get very much better asset management because nobody's ripped out the page in the book. We can actually get it electronically, which is very much key for us as well. For Building Smart, the BRE in the UK this week, we've done IFC and Kobe trials. And a key thing we've seen was reusability. There's many client cases in terms of government, in terms of we can use it at atomic level detail, in terms of a space asset level, or we can use it at portfolio level or right up the top because we've got a structured data set, we can make strategic foresight decisions. So many use cases for a client. And what we see in our Kobe UK trials, many different ways of getting it there. It might be for IFC, it might be for a proprietary system. But what we are seeing encouragingly through the trials is people are now, the rubber's hitting the road and people are actually moving on, trying to get these consistent data drops that are linked to plain language questions and it comes back to a piece of data. UK, we're practically applied this now. I'm not going to take this in any much detail, but through the Ministry of Justice, our first prison that you can see, Cook and Wood, 180 cells. I don't know anybody been to one of these places. Okay, yeah, I thought that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> 20 million pound, this is a new Young Offenders uh, Institute, but it's about process. You can see the process there. This is our first data drop, business case. So clunky geometry, we're looking at functionality spaces, we're looking at massing, so right of information, right of time. Our second drop, we're putting it out to the marketplace. We've got, if you like, objects within there now, so our level of details increased, and the idea is, Again, a PIM, a project information, goes for a design model with generic objects to putting in something from the supply chain. So we can test it, always building the data up, but start to think about data transactions. So projects are about to be handed over. The good news, more for less, a hypothesis, will we deliver it? Yes, probably 20% better. So in terms of benchmarking, we've kind of proved the hypothesis, which is nice. But probably for me, Emily, here's the governor of the story, telling the thing, could be part of this process. Better collaboration process, better for less, but better outcomes, I think, are the key. Better visibility, reduced risk, improved efficiency. So two things for BIM, added value and reduced risk. And that's what it always seems to come back to. So from that project, we're now learning. We've got at least 20 government projects that are pushing on. So we built off that hypothesis, probably 200 lessons learned. And we've got, you'll hear from Melanie, we've got 12 regional BIM hubs, all these community of practice now. Through the CIOB in the UK, who are helping us uh, lead that process, we're bringing these teams together, BIM for SME. So we're working with the institutes to try and push that together. So we're doing some great work. And again, thanks to CIOB for that as well. We're moving beyond level two as well. We mentioned we're moving towards a digital built Britain. And this is a key report, construction 2025. Forget about the bits on the left. Two things, because I'm looking at my time there, but faster delivery by 50%. Well, how do you do that? You can try and simulate, optimize, but actually this is about better digital procurement to try and get that down. Exports. We want to improve exports by 50%. Companies in the UK that are now doing BIM, real BIM I call it, are now starting to 
export their skills, new ways of working and winning work abroad. So again, towards a digital built Britain, that we're starting to think how we're going to use big data sets, smart cities, smart grids, and how we can leverage the benefits. And we'll start to see it converging with other things as well. So we're starting to think about our digital plans of work, but all these data sets coming together on a city-wide scale that are going to help us move to that digital built Britain <laughs> using new technologies that probably haven't been invented yet. Coming out of universities, scalability, 3D contour printing, these will be real in a couple of years that are going to change our industry. We will see smart cities, we'll see the internet of things, semantic data, asset rich things that will be constantly living. We heard Deep talk about the CFO that's got data insight. But what I think we'll see is a CFIO, 24 7 monitoring of assets, occupancy levels, BTRIMs, constantly feeding data to the Mac to make real time decisions using open internet. That internet of things will be key. So, what does that mean? Well, we're going to see new roles. Jobs that we haven't even thought about yet. So our education needs to change. 2025, the job roles will be indistinguishable. People have got to change. We've got to think more and more about T-shaped leaders. The T being people that think about our built environment. We should be thinking more about built environment before we go deep in terms of domain. So big challenge to universities, vocational levels, thinking about new careers. Not thinking about it in five years from now, but thinking about it very much now. There will be a skills gap. And the skills gap is we're preparing folk for jobs that don't exist yet, for technologies that haven't been invented, to solve problems they don't even know about yet. We've got to start thinking, having this foresight. In the UK, we've got a team called BIM 2050 for young professionals, which I chair as a, a young professional. Uh, I like to think anyway. But we are starting to think beyond. We're looking at, you know, we've got government support in this, but we're starting to think, what does the world look like? How is it changing? So we think, well, BIM is it for tomorrow? Well, it's about here and now, but I think there's two things you can do. You can either think, okay, I will be shaped for it, or you can be part of that future and try and shape, for me, a new Ireland. So it's going to be you know, technology efficient. It's going to think about better outcomes and I think a better economic message. So thank you for listening. Again, you can follow us, www.bimtaskgroup.org. Huge amount of information on there, test data. You can contact us or indeed, if you sure wish, you can follow us on Twitter as well. And thank you for listening to our story.